now. So welcome everybody to our third session of our case management training series. Today, we're going to be talking about understanding contracts and the importance of data. And we will start with some intros. I am Rosa McQuiggan. I'm the Family Program Officer at HOST. I oversee the contract for family shelters and family rapid rehousing programs, as well as a few other uh, random little contracts. I will pass it over to Mel, who is my co-host for today. Hey everyone, Mel Davis Campbell. I'm a shelter program administrator on our shelter systems operations team and excited to be here today. Wonderful. All right. So to get started, we are going to do a mentee just to kind of gauge um, what you all know about data and kind of get the conversation started. So if you want to go ahead and scan that QR code, or you can go to menti.com and enter the code. And our first question is, what is data? And I'll give everyone a, a little bit to answer that. And let us know if you're having trouble accessing the menti. You can either come off mute and let us know or put it in the chat. Statistics, that's a good one. I'm seeing it on my computer first. There we go. I see information and verifiable info, information. See if we can get a couple more responses. We have 20 people in here and we only got five up there. Facts, great. A tool, yes. Collection of facts. All right, well, it seems like you guys thankfully do seem to know what data is. So happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, you guys really hit on pretty much the basics of what data is. Um, it's facts, statistics collected for reference and analysis, facts, figures, information. So great job, these are all good responses. So we will move on to our next mentee question, which is what does data tell us? And this can be very broad. What's important for us to know quantifies information, the impact we're making, awesome specific information, see if we can get like four or five more answers here. What's happening, how it might affect us and how to plan and evaluate, yep. The way things are doing our work here or not, yep. Definitely evaluation, need data to evaluate. All right, well, I think you guys understand that piece really well. And then kind of drilling down a little bit further, what sort of data is important to the work we do? So our everyday work. So I know it sometimes can feel like there isn't a connection between working in the field and data, but there most definitely is. Some folks started touching on that in the last slide in terms of evaluation and what's working and what's not, our impact. Case notes, very important. I think someone was in the last training. <laughs> Progress benchmarks, definitely. And I'm assuming that means for clients, so making sure that they're on track and meeting their goals.
Client info, yep. To help others obtain goals, to set goals, definitely. How can you know if you reached a goal if you don't have any data? Analysis, definitely. Share with others, yep. All right, these are all really good responses. It seems like you guys all have a pretty good grasp on these concepts, so that is great. So we'll jump back over to our slide deck. And so just kind of highlighting some of the things that you guys already shared, but data is important because it's really our source of truth. It's how we know everything. Without data, we can't know things are facts. Um, in terms of the work we do, it tells us how a program and our system are performing. And so we need to look at the numbers served and um, successes, things like that, in order to know if a program is doing what we need it to do. And then also to determine future funding. Um, if a program is not doing super well, then we may need to consider what that means in terms of funding. And then if a program is doing exceptionally well, then that could mean we need to give them more money to have an even further impact. And how this really relates to us is that all of our contracts require specific data and outcomes. And how do you know if you're on track with what is in your contract? So I'm wondering if anyone here has actually seen their contract for their programs. And so we're gonna do another little round of mentees just to kind of get an idea of who has, I saw someone nodding vigorously, so that is great, I'm very happy. I know that when I was a case manager starting out, I didn't even know that there were contracts. I thought my bosses were just making things up and telling me to do them. So glad at least five of you, six of you, have seen your contract and are aware, hopefully, of what is in it, but that will be our next question. All right, let's see if we can get some more answers. This is an easy one for folks. There's about 15 of you, yeah. no, oh, 20 now. And if you can't get to the mentee, please let us know. Anyone? Oh, one person has not. All right, can we get a couple more answers here, maybe? Nope. Oh, one more, yes, okay. All right, we'll move to the next. I'm really impressed that so many people have seen their contracts. That's awesome. And I think that's probably a bit of a change in how things um, are happening in the field, which I'm very excited about. Um, so of those folks who have seen those contracts, or even if you haven't, do you know what the expected outcomes are for your program that are listed out in your contract? Do you know what an outcome is? Okay. No one understands. This is awesome. Glad it's heavy on the knowing, at least to some degree. Great. All right, awesome. So you guys are steps ahead of where I thought folks would be, so this is great. So now we're just going to kind of um, do an overview of what is in contracts, why it's important. Um, and kind of dig in a little bit here. So why is it important to understand your contract? And kind of like I started talking about, it's really important for you guys to understand what is being expected of you in your day-to-day -day work. So knowing how many clients you're supposed to serve each year is really important. So you're not just kind of wildly guessing at that. And then understanding how many are expected to 
exit to permanent housing, get access to mental health services, be referred to certain things. Um, it's really guiding your work. And you guys are the ones who are doing it. So it really matters that you all know. Um, the contract really outlines what we expect of you and what needs to be tracked and documented. Um, and so as we dig more into the data pieces and like the logic model that Mel will explain, that really tells you what you need to be entering into HMIS. Um, which we're really putting much more of an emphasis on in this next coming year. So making sure that you all understand that. And then lastly, it tells you how much money you have and what you can buy, which is the most exciting part. It also tells you what you cannot buy, which I'm sure that your accounting team would like you to know so you don't spend money on something that we can't pay you back for. So next, I'm just going to kind of go over what is in your contract. Um, most of it is boilerplate language, which is just kind of a standard template, very legalese heavy. And so not really something that most people read except for your attorneys. The first two pages are that. Um, then we have a couple pages of signatures. And so that's going to be leadership on your team and then leadership from the city. And then we jump into a couple of sections that are unique to each contract. And those are the parts that are really important. And so the first part is the scope of work. And this really outlines what the expectations are of your program, what the activities are, what your purpose is, um, the structure of the program, what we expect you to do. This also includes really important things like the amount of funding that you have for the year, the total contract award, and the contract date. So we're gonna look at a fake scope of work very quickly. And this is all made up. I just made up a number. I made up an agency. Um, so this is nobody's actual contract. The period of performance start and end dates. You can see this started at the beginning of this year and it goes until next year. And so that's the amount of time that you're allowed to spend this money. This right here, it says how much we're adding in. So this means this is an amended contract. So it was originally for $1 million, we added in another million for $2 million total. And then the purpose of this is for Sunshine Services to provide time-limited housing-focused case management and housing, case, housing navigation to families in emergency non-congregate shelter. And I picked that because that is what a lot of my contracts do. Um, funding source. So this tells you where the money is coming from. We have three main funding sources for our locally funded contract. That's homelessness resolution, general fund, um, and then the affordable housing property tax fund. We also have some federal funding um, through ARPA dollars, DOLA dollars, and ESG. I don't work as much with those, thankfully. And so I just stuck to a locally funded. Then we have the project name. It's usually fairly descriptive of what the project is. The budget type, um, all locally funded is focused cost reimbursement. I'm not going to dig into that today because that would be an entire new training. Um, but it really just says you need less documentation. The address of where it is and then organization type is nonprofit, which most of you guys are. The next part is where we really lay out the service description. So talking about the different types of activities that are expected of you all. I'm not going to read through all of this. It's pretty standard for what a shelter would provide. Um, but I would definitely encourage you all to become familiar with this part of your contract as it really outlines what we expect you to be doing on a regular day-to-day -day basis. The next part, so then after this part, we have some more boilerplate language. And then it usually is a table that has outcomes and output. We are going to be changing that to logic models in 2025, and Mel will dig into logic models after this slide. Um, but I'm just going to quickly show you guys this budget, as this is a pretty standard budget um, that is in all of our contracts. It's a pretty basic one, though. Um, so do know it generally can be a lot more complicated than this, but I didn't feel like doing a bunch of crazy math when I was putting this together. Um, so again, we're going to see the contractor name at the top, the contract number, the project name, the contract term dates, and then if it's a multi-year contract, which year of the contract it is. Because sometimes we do three-year contracts, 
and they could have different budgets each year. So make sure you're paying attention to that fiscal year. This first column that says agency total, this means what the entire project is gonna cost. We don't always fund an entire project. And so that's why this column may be different from the host funding column. The furthest column to the left, the budget category are your line items. And these are the different types of buckets that you're allowed to spend money on. And so this budget narrative is where you're really gonna see the explanation of what you can and cannot spend the money on. And this part is incredibly important for you to also be familiar with if you're the one doing the day-to-day -day spending, um, especially in terms of things like client support, we generally will outline what kind of expenses we are able to reimburse for. So that is an incredibly important line to be looking at. The other piece is indirect. And this is probably more for your finance folks, but it would also be um, probably helpful for you all to become familiar with this as well, as it's kind of like extra money we give you guys based on how much you spent that month that we don't require backup documentation for. And so it's generally 10% for any locally funded contract, but some federal contracts have differing um, percentages. And it's, it's pretty helpful to understand that number as well. I think for the most part, that is really the budget overview um, and what you need to know as a case manager. But like I said, really this bottom section is what's gonna be important for you to understand is this client support or program expense costs. So what you're allowed to spend your money on. Now, Mel is going to dig into the very important logic models, which is a new thing for all of us. Yes. So as Rosie mentioned, in 2025, our new contracts are going to all include logic models. Um, so it's super exciting that you all actually look at your contracts because it will be helpful for you all to understand the various components of logic models and what they are. So a logic model, if you're not familiar, is a visual representation of how a program's resources, activities, and outcomes all relate to one another. So you have before you the different components of a logic model with some definitions. So first section um, are the inputs. So these are just the resources that are going into the program. Then you have your activities. These are the things that you will be doing with, along with the clients to achieve the outcomes. These are often um, considered like the services that you provide your clients. Those lead to the outputs. Outputs are a way of really quantifying those activities that are being provided. Um, and finally, the end result and the thing that you hope to achieve through the program is the outcome. Um, so I know that might sound very vague, so we're gonna dive a bit deeper into each of those components and give examples as they might relate to your program. Um, so if folks don't mind, uh, take a moment, please think through what you think the input into your program might be. These, again, these are the resources. We're also going to use like a gardening analogy throughout this lesson, and so you can think of inputs as the seeds. Anyone have any guesses as to what the inputs into your program might be? Money, that is definitely um, a resource going into the program, absolutely. arguably one of the most important resources. Um, staff support to client physical resources. Yes, so really when we're thinking about, um, and, and Desiree, you put volunteer hours. Yes, what we're really thinking about here is like the human power. So the case managers, the housing navigators, you all are the resources. Um, so, that's amazing. You're the seeds. Can't do anything without the seeds. 
Next up, we have activities. So in keeping with our analogy, this would be all of the things that go into the gardening process. So watering, fertilizing. I'm not a gardener, so couldn't tell you what else, but all of those things that make a garden grow that you have to do. Um, can anyone share anything, any examples of an activity? Um, again, these are like the services that you provide to your clients. What are the activities that we're engaging in with our clients? Wraparound services. What might an example of a wraparound service be, Diane? So we do wrap around, which means we help with the employment, we help with health care, we help with referrals to mental health, um, I said employment. And then, of course, there's the long term goal of housing. Right. So then we also have housing, housing navigation. So it's a pretty I think when wraparound services were a smaller entity, so we do wrap around. So we do everything from getting their ID to housing them, like physically housing them into their new place through the course of their whole stay here at our site. Amazing. Yeah. So um, you touched on pretty much all of these examples here on the screen, which is awesome um, and makes sense since you're providing wraparound services. Um, but this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the most common activities that you'll see in your contracts are housing navigation, case management meetings, referrals, and then employment and benefits acquisition. Next up, we have the output. So the output is our tree. Um, an output is a quantifiable result of the activities that you have done. And it's how we measure those things that you're asked to do in your contract. Um, so some examples of outputs uh, include 50% of households will engage in housing focused case management. 75% of households will receive financial assistance. 800 households will be served annually. So again, we're really taking those activities that we just talked about and quantifying them. And lastly, we, we come to the outcomes. The outcomes are the fruit. Um, this is the intended accomplishment or the impact of the program, and it's how we know that we met the goal of the work. Um, most commonly, probably in most of your contracts, and the outcome will be related to a housing outcome. Um, but there are certainly other examples of outcomes, which we'll go over in a moment. Um, so you might see an outcome as 80% of households will exit into permanent housing. This is kind of the, the end goal of what we are working on, working toward. So we have some trivia questions here. Um, give you a chance to practice and think through whether something is an output or an outcome. So I will read a series of statements and if you could just type in the chat if you think it's an output or an outcome. So the first statement, 50% of households will receive employment or benefits acquisition support. Diane, you're quick. Desiree, you're quick. I love it. Yes, this is an output. We are measuring, quantifying an activity, and that activity is the employment and benefits support. Great job. Next one. 50% of households who engage in individualized case management services will exit to a stable or permanent housing situation. Yep, that's an outcome. Um, we're, again, we're talking about a, a housing destination. This is like the final achievement of all of your hard work. The next statement is 30 households will be served annually.
Yes, this is an output. Great job. And the last one is 50% of households increased their income. Good job, everybody. It is an outcome. Yeah. So that one might be a little tricky, not to you all, but <laughs> maybe to others. Um, but so an, like a, a way of thinking about this example is perhaps the, the output related to this example is um, that 70% of households will receive employment or benefits support, and then that leads to the outcome of 50% of households increase their income. Great job. You, uh, you guys are all prepared to interpret your logic models next year when we roll those out. Um, next up, we're going to talk a little bit more about data and why it's so important and how we collect our data. Um, so we're going to talk about everyone's favorite topic, which is HMIS. HMIS is a, HMIS use is a contractual requirement. Um, and so that is why we're always harping on it and talking about it. Um, and that is true, I guess, unless you um, serve survivors of domestic violence, in which case for privacy, and safety reasons, that's not a requirement. HMIS is our main source of data here at HOST. Data must be recorded in HMIS in order for us to count it and in order for us to track your outputs and your outcomes. If you are not familiar with MDHI, that stands for Metro Denver Homeless Initiative, and they are our HMIS lead agency. So they handle trainings. They have their virtual help desk, which um, they're great for answering questions or fixing like data issues or errors that you can't fix on your own. Um, and they have all of the documents and forms on their website as well that are to be completed with clients. And how do we know what to record in HMIS? Again, you will want to be looking to your contract. So um, what is recorded in HMIS really depends on the program type and the specific requirements in your contract. Generally, well, really always, it'll start with creating a client profile. You need to have a client in HMIS to attach these other things to. Um, and then generally, it'll involve an enrollment and an exit for each client, for each household and um, a requirement of services to be entered as well. And if you're not sure which services you need to be entering into HMIS, again, you will want to be looking at your contract. So um, eventually you'd be able to look at the outputs in the contract and, and um, the activities and note what needs to be recorded. Um, you can also look in the scope of work, anything that is called out as an activity that needs to be done um, and that needs to be quantified in some type of way will need to be recorded as a service. Um, and then ideally, it's great if you're also recording your case notes in HMIS um, and uploading clients' vital documents. Um, that is extremely helpful when clients move from program to program. So we don't have to be collecting those repeatedly. It's, it's also great when, well, not great. It's helpful when a client loses their documents, we have a record of those somewhere. And then lastly, um, best practice is updating contact info as well. It, this is super important to help facilitate warm handoffs, referrals to other programs. Um, so that is what needs to be recorded in date in HMIS. Want to touch quickly on data timeliness standards, since this is something that we also care about at host. Um, so if you're wondering how quickly after you provide a service or you enroll or exit a client, how quickly does that need to be inputted into HMIS? Uh, it depends on your program type. So Emergency shelters, we have it the worst, unfortunately, with 
that requirement being same day for everything. Um, we need to know about those things as soon as they happen. Other than that, outreach programs are um, two working days and other types of programs are generally more like seven days. Um, so definitely be paying attention to the data the data timeliness standards. And what are we at host looking for? Um, and what can we see in terms of data? We are very lucky in that we have these really great dashboards um, on our end that we can easily view programs outcomes, your demographics. We can see shelter utilization on any given night. We can easily look at data quality and even racial equity. And we're really mostly looking at the number of people or number of households that your program is serving, whether that's in a, a quarter or annually, and looking at their outcomes, where they're exiting to. Um, and we're also looking at those services entered that we've, we've already touched on and data quality. So that uh, the data timeliness standards that I just went over, that impacts your data quality also missing data, that impacts data quality. We're looking at all of that. We're also looking at length of time enrolled just to make sure that it's um, an appropriate length of time in terms of the services that you're providing. We also look at demographics and racial equity. So who are your program participants by race and ethnicity? What are the exit outcomes by race and ethnicity? How does that info compare to not only just our general Denver population, but the population of clients that should be eligible for your program. And just wanting to make sure that um, our programs across our, our system are performing in a way that is racially equitable. And then of course we look at quarterly and yearly trends by program and for our entire system. So um, for example, how many families have we served in family shelter this year versus at this, this point last year. Um, we're looking at all of those things continually to um, ensure that, that our programs are performing as they should be. And why do we care about this so much? Um, there's this saying that we want someone's homelessness experience to be rare brief and one time, but how do we know that we're living up to that statement um, for that individual person and then for our community as a whole? We look to data to answer really big questions like, are we meeting the needs of our community? So are we aligning our community's needs with our capacity and our services? Are we increasing exits to permanent housing and are we decreasing returns to shelter are we sheltering more people? Um, I think most people know this has been a, a pretty big focus of our current mayoral administration, but um, reducing the number of unsheltered people. And are we helping people experience homelessness for shorter periods of time? And are we funding the right programs? Um, and with all of these big questions, it's really important to remember that these outcomes and these big questions and big ideas really have to work together. And we can't put all of our focus on solving one of these questions or one of these big challenges. So we can't decrease returns to shelter without increasing exits to permanent housing. We also, we don't want to just focus on someone's length of stay or shortening someone's homelessness experience without also having that focus on quickly rehousing people. So all of these big questions have to work together um, in terms of solving this really big issue. And so we can't answer these big questions without data and we can't obtain that data without your assistance. So thank you all for not only doing the work but also for recording what you're doing. And with that, we will open it up to questions. Great. Well, if there's no questions, then we will end a little bit early. And thanks, everyone, for attending today.
and I hope you have a great rest of your day.